And joining us now is New York City mayoral candidate, Maya Wiley. Ms. Wiley, thank you so much for taking the time today. Oh, it's a pleasure to be with you, Linda, and please call me Maya. Maya, we are gonna jump right into it because New York is facing so many challenges right now. The next mayor is going to have to lead New York out of this devastating pandemic and the devastated economy that it left in its wake. Um, but as someone who has done work on equality for so many years, you know that the economy wasn't working for a lot of New Yorkers, even pre-pandemic. So what does a Mayor Maya Wiley focus on when she first gets into office, not just to shepherd the city out of this devastated economy, but to make it work going forward? Oh, thank you for that question, Linda, because it's such an important one. We had an affordability crisis before COVID hit. We have been struggling, frankly, with racial issues and racial injustice for generations, actually, but coming to a head as we saw this summer. You know, and we've had this kind of spiritual exhaustion because of the division, because of the struggle of daily life, and then COVID hits, and now we're traumatized, and our economy is in tatters. We have 400,000 people facing eviction. We have over 2 million going hungry. This is a crisis of historic proportion. But as the candidate in this race, it has also been in that hot kitchen we call City Hall. I also know that we have resources and we have resources that we can use in order to not just meet the needs of our people right now, but start to solve some of our affordability issues. So for example, I have a plan called New Deal New York and we're gonna create 100,000 new jobs by spending $10 billion of our capital construction budget. That is separate from our expense budget. That's the budget where we build things we need built and where we fix things we need fixed. But that's stimulative. And what we're gonna do is focus that in addition to creating those jobs, 100,000 jobs is not a small number, but we are gonna do it by building things like affordable housing that are affordable whether you earn $50,000 a year or $15,000 a year. But the other thing we're gonna do is think about what happened for so many families, Linda, including in particular women, right? We, women have lost a decade in this crisis of, of work gains. And, you know, and the cost of childcare and elder care was a big, one of the top three expenses in the city before COVID. But what we're gonna do is put $5,000 a year into the pockets of the 100,000, starting with 100,000 of our neediest families to care, to care for children and elderly adults. But we're also gonna create community care centers, drop off centers, quality care. That means we're replacing some of the jobs with good union jobs that women have lost, particularly women of color in the caring economy but also in a way that helps families get by because there is a safe place with quality care for their children or their elderly parents or grandparents so they can work those hours they need to work uh, and not come out of their pocket and be worried about how they pay rent at the end of every month. You know, you mentioned in there too, um, the racial justice protests that we saw all year and really the national reckoning we've had on race and on police accountability. And after you worked in the de Blasio administration, you headed up the CCRB, the Civilian Complaint Review Board. And I wanted to know, as you watched the racial justice protests this year, what messages did you see being communicated or not communicated, either by uh, police or protesters or the city that mm -hmm. as mayor you would have wanted to communicate? Well, you know, first of all, I think we have to communicate that it is in important for our people to be safe. But that means safe from crime and safe from police violence. And that, I call that putting the public back in public safety where what we do is focus on what is an appropriate job for the police department with appropriate rules of the road. So it's very clear what you can and cannot do. And then there's clear accountability if you decide to go off-roading. But where we're also investing, because a big part of what demonstrators, including myself, when I was demonstrating, were calling for, was for us to invest in problem solving in our communities. And, you know, that's critically important because we are traumatized, but we know that trauma also be, can beget violence. I'm going to put trauma-informed care in the schools. You know, we know 
that if you are a kid who's had trauma, but you get the right kind of therapy, trauma-informed care, our violence in schools goes down 50% and graduation rates go up 20%. I call that a good investment in not in our children who are our most precious, precious uh, you know, people, but also in our public safety. It's just a win-win. And I think that's what people were calling for. And I think we have to make it a people-centered approach. You know, on that uh, topic, Mayor de Blasio announced recently that he's creating a task force to examine structural racism in the city and how the city can address it. And he said in there that he expects his successor to continue that work of that task force. I wondered um, what your reaction was when you heard that announcement. Well, listen, I was glad that there was attention, that the mayor was calling attention and creating a process for focusing on issues that are his systemic and structural around race, because it is, it is a multi-generational problem. Um, here's what it calls for. Uh, it calls for a person who understands how we make a difference in people's lives, including communities of color, by making change, by showing government how to do things differently and better. That's what I've done my whole career as a civil rights lawyer and a racial justice advocate. But let, one of our tools is the budget, which has to be a moral document. And I just wanna call out because, you know, I was so disappointed and disturbed when I heard Andrew Yang say that the mayor should not spend stimulus money to solve problems that require investment. Let, let's just unpack this because what we need is leadership that understands how the city budget works in order to do some of what we need to do for communities of color and our city. You can't just wake up one day and say, we need to get the trash picked up and then wake up the next day and say, we won't spend the money that, we shouldn't spend the money coming that will help us pick up the trash. I mean, by saying what Andrew Yang said, what he was really saying is, you know, let's not invest money the federal government is sending us to invest in people to come out of this crisis. Uh, well, let's make sure that we're not funding 3K, something we desperately need and our families desperately need for more affordability. Let's not uh, do things like picking up the garbage. Let's not hold on to our workforce who, by the way, as city workers are our residents are taxpayers and have families to feed. Uh, this is something that requires us, if we're gonna come with a lens that says every single one of our residents has to be doing better, has to be able to live a quality life in the city, including people of color, including people who are black or Latino or Asian, that that means investment. And that means a lens that understands how that investment has to happen that brings us all back. And uh, that leads me to talking about schools here in the city when you talk about the equity, especially for communities of color, for black and brown communities. You've actually talked about, as a child, experiencing going to both public and private schools. So what needs to get focused on in the city to deal with the, the massive problems? The schools are segregated, um, the unequal conditions that we get across the city. How does a mayor, Meyer Wiley, handle those problems? So starting with the principles, you know, Mayor Maya Wiley says, you know, every last one of our children is amazing and exceptional and deserves an exceptional education. So part of that means we've got to ensure that we're getting more dollars into the classroom. Uh, that means we've got to take the resources we're getting both from the federal government in the form of additional resources for our schools, but also in our conversations with Albany, about what the best investments are to help us come back. And that does include our kids who've lost a year thanks to COVID. Um, some of our kids struggling to get online, to do online learning. That also means, and it's something I have done inside City Hall, is show city government how to do free broadband, getting every single apartment in Queensbridge houses free service that the city paid for. I did that as counsel to the mayor. I know how to get it done, but we have to do that now because we don't develop the educational opportunities for our kids if we're not solving that digital divide. Um, so that is critically important. I think we all recognize it. But look, we have to stop with the policies that discriminate against kids. 
We do. We should not be using any admission standards that aren't really about um, what kids need, but are rather about what families have the resources to pay for the tutoring that gets them over the hump on a test. First of all, families shouldn't have to do that. And far too many of our families don't have the resources to do it. And it's not meeting an educational agenda. Uh, but I trust uh, principals and teachers also to be more innovative. So I'm gonna cut some of the bureaucracy that's coming out of, of, of the Department of Education to free up some of that innovation because there is a lot of it in our system, but it gets strangled by some of these, some of these rules rather than really thinking about what serves the need of our students, particularly at a time when we have so much to do to help them come back. I just have one last question uh, that I'm able to ask. So I wanted to know, as someone who has worked in the de Blasio administration, what do you think of the city's response and the mayor's response uh, to the COVID crisis here in the city? And it, yeah. what would you have done differently? Well, first, let's just acknowledge that it was an unprecedented crisis. And when it was first unfolding in the spring, you know, we had a federal government that was not telling the truth, um, that was actually not helping and actually threatening to punish and punishing New York because it had democratic leadership. And that's not the way we should lead as Americans in this country. Um, but we learned a lot from some of the things that I think are clear. We should have closed the school sooner. We should have used the summer, recognizing that a vaccine was gonna come. And even we even had independent experts saying, no, this is real. We will have a vaccine and we will have one probably by the end of the year. That gate should have given us the summer both to be working with our principals, our parents, uh, our teachers on how to reopen schools safely, how to communicate and ensure that parents and families understood what was gonna happen so they could make the best decisions for themselves, understand and have transparent information about safety, but also be investing in our teachers so that they could deliver online lear learning effectively you know, that was a real opportunity to use the summer for that. Uh, but I would also say that now, you know, as we're seeing vaccine rollout, I would have been partnering with community-based organizations, with our churches and our synagogues and our mosques, all our religious institutions to be vaccine sites or to be able to register their communities for the vaccine. Because one of the reasons we had saw a racial disparity in who is getting the vaccine is because people couldn't get online to make the appointments, um, didn't know how to navigate the system or were afraid. But when you have trusted partners and leaders in the community, they're really able to reach people in the way that they need to be reached also with language issues. It helps solve the language, some of the language barriers some of our residents have. So I think there's a real opportunity moving forward to partner more with our communities so that we're getting the job done well. And that's something city government must do. Maya Wiley, I would like to talk to you so much more about your work studying the digital divide and all of your work at the new school and everything we do with the city. So I hope you will uh, give us some time again later. Maya Wiley is a candidate for New York City mayor. Thank you so much for joining us. And we appreciate all that detail from a mayoral candidate on policies and what you would actually do. So thank you so much for your time today. Thank you, and I will absolutely love to be back. Thank you for having me.